Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know. You can find us online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter and on your YouTube channel. I'm Judge Ladaris Hazard Cordell and your moderator for today's program. Michael Waldman is president of the Nonpartisan Law and Policy Institute at New York University School of Law called the Brennan Center for Justice. Their work focuses on improving the systems of democracy and justice. Waldman was a director of speech writing for President Bill Clinton, writing nearly 2,000 speeches, and is one of the nation's most prominent public interest lawyers and is an expert on the American presidency, democracy, and the Constitution. He is the author of several books, including his latest, the Fight to Vote, the history of the long power struggle to win voting rights for all citizens. We're very pleased Michael Waldman has come back to San Francisco to talk about holding on to our most fundamental democratic ideal, the right to vote. Michael, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be with you. And as, as I said, it's always great to be at the Commonwealth Club. Uh, President Clinton always told us about a speech that Franklin Roosevelt gave laying out the New Deal before he was president here. And uh, it's a great honor to be part of that right. tradition. So Michael, I must tell you that I, I never realized how ignorant I am of history until I read your terrific book, The Fight to Vote. And some of the quotes in your book are just draw dropping. For example, here's a quote. Someone said, poor people would be tempted to dispose of their votes, literally to sell them. The poor are duped, easily induced to fraud. Blocking their vote would actually help them. And those words, you wrote, were uttered by William Blackstone, the great English jurist who supported giving propertied white men the right to vote. So let's start off with one person, one vote. No matter how hard we look, we're not going to find it anywhere in the Constitution. One person, one vote. Why is that? Well, at the time the Constitution was written, as you say, first of all, only white men who owned property were allowed to vote. And that was the tradition handed down from England. And there'd been some change, some breaking through of the ice, as it were, during the Revolution. But there was no notion that this uh, right to vote was something that needed to be as wide and as universal as possible. Um, and so the Constitution itself does not refer to the right to vote. Uh, and uh, it doesn't uh, say that you don't have the right to vote. It doesn't say you do have the right to vote. Interestingly, of course, the institutions it established uh, included some that were popularly elected. James Madison, arguing for the House of Representatives in public, said that uh, who are to be the electors of the new government? Uh, not the rich more than the poor, not the learned more than the ignorant, not the haughty heirs of famous names more than the humble sons of unpropitious fortune. The great body of the people are to be the electors. But then, of course, they had the United States Senate, where they knew even then that they were creating an American version of what in England were called rotten boroughs, where uh, not a lot of people lived, but they got equal representation. And at that time, uh, the difference between a big state and a small state was about four to one. And now, of course, Wyoming has about less than a million people, and California has uh, maybe 50, 55 million. So but we each have two senators. And each two, two senators. Yeah. And that has been felt in everything uh, from budgets to Supreme Court confirmations. So this idea uh, of equal voice and equal vote was not in the Constitution, but they knew, even then, they knew that there could be manipulation, there could be what we would call gerrymandering, there could be lines drawn that would make some people's votes not count. And they actually gave Congress the power in something called the Elections Clause to override state rules, precisely because they knew that state legislators might pass laws to make it harder for their opponents or their opponent's supporters to vote. So let's talk about this presidential campaign, starting with the Electoral College. Hmm. Because as I think about it, doesn't it fly in the face of one person, one vote? I mean, a candidate can get the majority of the actual votes of the people, but not win the election because of the Electoral College. So what's up with that? So of course, the Electoral College is, is one of the greatest uh, 
repudiations of, of that notion of one person, one vote, and it's something we don't think about very often until it blows up, and then, uh, <laughs> then we think about it a lot. Four <clears throat> times in the country's history, um, the person who did not get the most popular votes nonetheless became president, the most recent of those being 2000, of course. Uh, and political scientists with rare concision call this the wrong winner problem. But the, the, the problem with the electoral vote is not only in those um, rare but, but uh, uh, n not unknown times when the wrong person wins, when somebody who doesn't get the uh, popular vote wins. It's what it does and how it distorts our campaigns the rest of the time. Um, if you look at where campaigns spend their time, if you look at where campaigns spend their money, increasingly it is just a few states and in fact just a few counties in a few states. Uh, and whether it's California or New York or Texas, where a lot of people live, don't get remotely the attention uh, as a few counties in uh, Miami-Dade or, or in uh, suburban Ohio. So it's one of the great distortions. You could end the Electoral College with a constitutional amendment. Uh, but there is actually a, a way to get around it with something called national popular vote, which is in effect a, an interstate compact uh, where states would agree they would vote for the popular vote, uh, whoever won the popular vote if enough other states did it. But it's one of those built-in distortions in our constitution that we still live with because of the distinct way we started out as a country. Interesting. Um, there's a quote in your book, I'm going to read it, I was fascinated by it, and it says, you wrote, <clears throat> voting law changes have tended to follow assassinations or wars. Campaign finance laws follow scandal. So could you please explain that? And then speaking of campaign finance, talk to us about Citizens United, <clears throat> decided by the Supreme Court January 21st, 2010, and its impact on this presidential campaign. Well, it's often these big <clears throat> historic events, these disruptions, these, uh, these seismic occurrences that shake things up and, and actually lead to expansions of democracy. So from that time when, uh, when we started out as nothing close to what we would consider a real democracy, um, we've expanded that right to vote. And also, the, not just the formal right, but the sense that e equality of participation really has to be upheld. The very first victory, ironically, for uh, voting rights in America was for what we would consider the angry white working class men in the period of the 1820s and the 1830s, uh, the period we would call Jacksonian democracy. And that came in part because uh, of the revolution and the War of 1812, where people who couldn't vote nonetheless bore arms in defense of the country. The Civil War African-American men, uh, it was seen that they had earned their place. Um, and you often see that kind of sense of not only people um, gaining the right, uh, in a sense, to, to be at the table, but just a shaking up of old assumptions. That's wars, and that's assassinations. Scandals. Um, tend to draw the line on the role of wealth and money and private power in our democracy. And from the beginning, these days, we tend to think of campaign finance and voting as in different, uh, different wings of, of the issue, different, different topics. But from the start, they saw the, those uh, two things as, as really part of the same fight for democracy. They understood that excessive private wealth could distort things. Um, and so Watergate was the greatest of the scandals. There was a major scandal around the turn of the century where life insurance companies uh, were caught giving campaign contributions to politicians. And that, among other things, led to the 17th Amendment, which gave people the right to vote for United States Senator. That was their version of campaign finance reform. They thought that state legislatures were corrupt and bought by the interests. Watergate, of course, gave us another wave of laws. And the Supreme Court uh, in 2010, as folks know, upended the whole century of campaign finance laws, including the laws going back to that Teddy Roosevelt era scandal in Citizens United. Uh, it's the most unpopular current Supreme Court decision by far, about 80% disapproval, Republicans and Democrats. And what it said was, uh, the, the, the bumper sticker that startled people at the time was that corporations are people, that they, you could not ban corporations from campaign spending uh, the way uh, we always had. 
that turned out to be both a simple oversimplification of what the decision said, but not nearly as important as uh, something else the opinion said, which was that if a campaign spending were supposedly independent of the candidate, it could not, as a matter of constitutional law, be corrupting or a problem. And hence the explosion of super PACs and the flood of outside spending. And so we now have a situation in the, where in the last election, the top 100 donors gave more than the 4.75 million small donors combined. And that is a level of concentrated political wealth we have not seen since that Gilded Age, since the robber barons. It was, it's not a completely simple story, of course. Uh, in this election, Bernie Sanders uh, is raising his funds from small contributors. Um, Donald Trump is bragging that he can't be bought because he's self-financing, although he's not even spending very much money. And Jeb Bush, of course, blew through $100 million in super PAC money. So it's not, it's not that this money inevitably buys an electoral result, but it emphatically can uh, affect the, the thinking of the, uh, the public servants who, who should be working for us. Wow. Uh, you no, know, I didn't realize that there were so many, actually six, constitutional amendments dealing with the right to vote. So I, I immediately I thought of, I know the 15th Amendment the, gave black males the right to vote, the 17th Amendment, the right to vote for the people to vote for US senators, the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote, the 24th Amendment eliminated the poll tax, and then the 26th Amendment, yes, um, gave 18-year-olds the right to vote. But there's Very also, good. well, I read the book, I'm good. Um, but there, there's a, the 14th Amendment, right. which I was really surprised. The 14th Amendment, we all think of due process, equal protection. What did it have to do with the right to vote? And that's the very first time the phrase the right to vote occurs in the Constitution. So as you know, after the Civil War, um, the, uh, the issue of voting rights for African Americans was really front and center. And one of, the, one of the things that was striking in researching the book was learning just how central this issue was over and over and over again. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was not for extending voting rights to African American men. He was actually against it in his whole career. But the war changed him, as we were discussing. The war, he, he, he changed his view on this as on other things. And by the time of the surrender at Appomattox, uh, he spoke two days after uh, Robert E. Lee surrendered uh, to Ulysses Grant. And after Frederick Douglass and other abolitionists were saying, now the fight for voting rights is the key. Um, and Lincoln got up and in this, from the second floor of window of the White House, gave his first major speech on Reconstruction on what he wanted to do. And he said, by the way, in the course of the speech, by the way, uh, many have criticized me for not extending voting rights to African-American men. I now agree with that. I think that those who served in the military, who were educated, should get the right to vote. And he actually, uh, at a cabinet meeting, m indicated he would go further. And at least one person in the audience caught the significance of what he said. According to historians, John Wilkes Booth gasped that means citizenship. That will be the last speech he ever gives. And he tried to get the guy standing next to him to shoot Lincoln on the spot. Um, he wouldn't do that, so Booth vowed, well, then I'll put him through. And two days later, went to Ford's Theater. So I, I'm not, I don't want to pretend Booth was a big Lincoln fan before that. Right, His right. previous plan was to kidnap right. him. But, he, but that step. didn't work out so well. But it was, this was a central issue. So for the 14th Amendment, uh, the southern states were out of the Union. They were no longer represented in, in the Congress. Um, and in the original Constitution, as you know, uh, African Americans, the slaves, were counted as three-fifths of a person. And they basically um, were trying to come up with a way, when they did the 13th Amendment, they freed the slaves, but they didn't adjust the representation. It was almost a math error. So the South would be able to come back in with disenfranchised black citizens and have more political power and more representation. So this 14th Amendment says, to the extent a state disenfranchises its voters and denies the right to vote, it loses its representation in Congress. And at the time, for all the fight, as important as we know, those glorious but vague 
and grand phrases are equal protection and due process. At the time, they thought this, this, disenfran this reduction in representation might have been the most important part of the wow. 14th Amendment. So let's talk about the 15th Amendment, giving black men the right to vote. Um, reading your book, you've said that there's a loophole in the 15th Amendment, and it's a big one. So it's a big one, and, and <clears throat> as we learn about the current laws that some of us think disenfranchise voters, uh, it's a similar kind of loophole. The 15th Amendment prohibits discrimination based on race uh, or color, but it doesn't prohibit things that are not explicitly based on race, things that look neutral on their face but undeniably have that kind of impact. And they knew at the time that it was a loophole. They actually needed to do it to get the bill through Congress. And the, one of the lead, they enlisted one of the leading abolitionists, Wendell Phillips, to write. A, he wrote a, an editorial saying, let's be a little less pure here and get this thing through Congress. And ironically, it created the ability to pass things from literacy tests uh, to uh, uh, voter ID laws that disproportionately and predictably affect people of color or particular communities, but as long as it's not explicitly based on race, it's, it's, uh, it's much harder to challenge under the 15th Amendment. I mean, I gotta give them kudos for creativity. I mean, it's, yeah. just, it's amazing. Sausage making. Amazing. Um, Gore v. Bush election mm -hmm. decided by the Supreme Court hinged on those hanging chads and counting the ballots in Florida. Uh, to my surprise, I read in your book that we've been here before in the election, presidential election of 1876. Can you tell us about that? So the presidential election of 1876 was very significant. After the 15th Amendment passed, um, Reconstruction uh, was underway in the South, and there was a flowering of democracy in the South. Um, voter participation rates among African-American men there reached 90%. Hundreds of black men were elected to legislatures, to Congress, to governorships, to the Senate. Um, but uh, there was a violent response, terrorism, from the Ku Klux Klan and other uh, white uh, terrorist groups that were basically serving as a military arm of the Democratic Party at that time, and cowardice from the North. And what happened was, in 1876, there was an election. It appeared that the Democrats were ready to take back the White House, and it was Tilden versus Hayes. And then uh, on election night, some very quick-thinking political operatives all declared victory. And there wound up being a series of recounts and contested ballots and contested states. And it all came down, yes, to Florida. It all came down wow. to a recount, and the decision was made by a Supreme Court justice. Um, but the, the, uh, the real deal was that in exchange for the Republicans getting one more turn at the White House, even though they probably had lost the election, they agreed to withdraw the troops and pull back. And that started the process of disenfranchisement of the black voters in the South and the, eventually the Jim Crow laws, uh, legal segregation, and the constitutions there that entirely disenfranchised African-American voters. And that became the central political fact in the United States for almost a century. So the backlash against immigrants, that's had a huge impact on voting rights. For example, you note that the California Constitution hmm. in 1870 declared that no native of China could ever vote and that this provision was upheld by the courts. How, how could that be? Well, because it didn't <clears throat> say their race. It could be a white missionary born in China also could not vote. Of course, that's transparently absurd, but that was the rationale under the 15th Amendment that allowed that to happen. Um, there was, interestingly, you know, we think of uh, one of the lessons of the book, one of the lessons of our history is, is that history does not only move in one direction. Um, we've been expanding our democracy, but there have been times when it's gone backwards. And of course, in the South, after the Civil War, eventually that's what happened. To a lesser degree, but a surprising degree, it happened in the North as well. Um, the cities of the North now were filled with immigrants, not from Mexico, as you hear people talk about today, but from Ireland and Italy and Poland and Europe. And so many of the same fears about immigrants voting uh, and immigrant power were then felt by the kind of uh, the, the blue bloods of the time. Um, and they, uh, they found a number of ways to make it harder 
for the new immigrants, the new working class immigrants to vote. Um, you had John Adams' great grandson, and there's all these amazing things. The the editor of the Nation magazine was against voting rights. Walt Whitman wrote a, wrote an article saying, you know, I'm not sure this voting is such a good idea after all. And John Adams' great grandson said that if you had universal suffrage, you would have a, a, a rule by the pr uh, ignorant. Celtic proletariat in the north, the African proletariat in the south, and the Chinese proletariat in the west. So they found ways uh, to cut back on voting rights and suppress participation. Again, many of them on their face make sense or at least look neutral. The institution of voter registration laws, for example. Um, but they were done in such a way that first, and, first of all, only the big cities had voter registration out in the rural areas, they didn't have them. Even things like the secret ballot, which was a way of trying to deal with real fraud, wound up uh, being almost a form of a literacy test. Because previously you could show up and vote and you didn't have to be able to read what the county assessor was and figure it all out on a ballot. Um, there were a whole host of manipulative ways. Even one of my favorites was that um, in New York City, voter registration only occurred on one day and that was Yom Kippur. Which was, which was seen by the, this was Tammany Hall, the Democratic machine's attempt to cut down on the Jewish vote. Because they thought they were all socialists. So that kind of stuff happened. And we know that voter turnout and voter participation is distressingly low right now. Last year, or two years ago in the 2014 election, voter turnout uh, plunged to the lowest level in 72 years in the United States. That's a real sickness in our democracy. But it's important to understand, participation has actually been low for a long time, actually since the turn of the 20th century. All these things taken together, uh, together with l uh, less political organizing by political parties, a lot of other things actually tended to push participation down below uh, where it had been. The movement for women's suffrage, it's fascinating, and in the end, it was successful. The 19th Amendment, uh, gave women the vote. It was ratified by the states in 1920. Now, two people were especially important in this <laughs> effort, I learned from reading your book, and I'm not talking about Susan B. Anthony. I'm talking about Inez Milholland and Harry Byrne. Can you tell us about them? Two people who, who uh, are, have been <clears throat> uh, lost to obscurity but played vivid roles. So, you know, after this period in, at the end of the 19th century where democracy really went backwards, we had the progressive era, as it was called, and there was a real response. Uh, uh, from top to bottom, people were unhappy with the way democracy was working. They felt the system was rigged. They felt that the institutions of government were not working for them. And they, they enacted a whole series of reforms to expand the power of the vote, the most significant of which was the 19th Amendment. Um, and we kind of skip over it. You know, it's seen as, as a less dramatic uh, fight than, say, the civil rights fights later. But it was every bit as fiercely contested. The day before his inauguration as president, Woodrow Wilson got off the train in Washington and was expecting to be greeted by the throng of people. And there was basically nobody there to greet him. There was the Princeton Glee Club. That was about it. They belted out a song, and the New York Times covered it and said they made up in making up in enthusiasm what was lacking in numbers. And the Times was Demo <laughs> Democratic newspaper even then. Um, and finally, Wilson's uh, aide said, "Where are all the people?" And one of the greeters sort of nervously said, "Well, they're all down on Pennsylvania Avenue." There was a march for women's suffrage organized by a handful of young women, uh, mostly in their 20s, who many of them had come over. They'd been graduate students in England uh, participating in the fight for women's voting rights there and come back. And they said, we're going to do something audacious. We're going to try to actually pass a constitutional amendment. 5,000 women marching down Pennsylvania Avenue, many in costume, and led by a young woman dressed as a Greek goddess on a white horse named Inez Milholland. She's the first, uh, uh, the first person, and, and she, I am proud to say, uh, was a recent graduate of NYU School of Law, where the Brennan Center is. <laughs> and in fact, uh, there was recently a professorship named after her, and nobody really knew who she was uh, at the time. But she was leading the parade, and on either side on Pennsylvania Avenue, there were 100,000 men. Many of them were drunk, 
They were there for the inauguration. They began throwing things and spitting, and broke through the police lines and assaulted the women. A hundred women went to the hospital. It was a very big deal. It was all publicized. It kind of overshadowed the coverage of the inauguration. The police chief of Washington, D.C. had to resign. And in that moment, with that publicity about that violence directed at those nonviolent marchers, public opinion swung in support of women's voting rights. Michael, and I that, thought that's, that's just like, like the Selma. civil rights, it's like right. Selma, right? It's just like Selma, 50 years later. They pioneered the tactics of civil disobedience and, and protest. It was before Gandhi, if you think about it, as well as before the American labor movement and certainly before the civil rights movement. And then it took several more years. There were hunger strikes. They, were, um, they picketed the White House for two years straight, formed their own political party, and finally got through Congress during World War I because Woodrow Wilson was talking about democracy so much, it was too hypocritical to evade it. Uh, the amendment was sent to the states and the southern states were against it. They didn't like the idea of meddling with voting rights, even for white women. And uh, it all came down to a vote in Tennessee. And they went through ballot after ballot, and it was a tie. And one 24-year-old state representative who'd voted against women's voting rights over and over again sat there on, on the floor of the legislature, and this was gonna be the last vote, and everyone from all over the country was there to watch. And he had a letter in his hand from, from his mother. This is Harry Burns. Harry Burns. And it said, put the rat in ratification. Um, be a good boy and listen to your mother. And he switched his vote to I. And it entered the Constitution. And he had to hide in the attic of the state legislature wow. from everybody who wanted to beat him up wow. for having done this. Wow, so a man. A man listened to his mother. Was responsible for the 19th Amendment. Was responsible. Wow. Amazing. And it, think about that. That doubled the size of the electorate right. like that. Right. Let's talk more about the courts. Um, you write in your book, the courts have largely been absent from throughout most of American history. The courts have largely been absent from the fight to expand democracy. So before we get to the recent Supreme Court decision that basically gutted the Voting Rights Act of 1965, there was an even more egregious case you talk about in your book in 1903, and you wrote about this case. It was the decisive turning point in the Supreme Court's removing democracy from the agenda of constitutional law, the case of Giles versus Harris. It's a fascinating case, and it's one that is not really taught so much in law schools, but it, it, it should be. Um, the Supreme Court throughout American history has been a bit pay player uh, in the fight for democracy, in the fight for expanding the right to vote. It's one reason there have been so many amendments. Um, there was, for a long time, what, uh, what's known as the political question doctrine, the idea that if something was too political that the court would stay out. But these new disenfranchising laws these, uh, in the South, the new constitutions, were just such an obvious violation of the letter and the spirit of the 15th Amendment. There were actually efforts made to go to court then uh, to try to get the US Supreme Court to overturn it. And this case, Giles v. Harris, challenged one of the state constitutions. Um, the case was something people followed closely. It was secretly financed by Booker T. Washington, who publicly had made peace with segregation and privately was paying for the lawsuit to undo it. And uh, Susan B. Anthony was speaking about it at a mass meeting in, in Brooklyn, New York, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music and up in Rochester. And then the word came that the Supreme Court had said, yeah, this seems to be uh, egregious. This seems to be a denial of, uh, of voting rights. It seems to be targeted at, um, at the black men of the South, but there's nothing we can do about it. And the opinion was written by Oliver Wendell Holmes, one of the greatest Supreme Court justices, he said that for us to actually try to do, you know, for us to rule that this is unconstitutional, then not be able to do anything about it would be to write in the air. Um, and if we were going to really try to enforce this, we would have to send troops to the South and have federal supervision of elections and all the stuff, of course, that exactly is what happened in the Voting Rights Act and since. So he, he just threw up his hands and said, there's nothing we can do about it. And from that point on, with rare exceptions, it was not the Supreme Court. Uh, it was not the Supreme Court that, that issued the great rulings that addressed voting rights and its denial in the United States. 
um, it, w it was uh, a shrugging of the shoulders that had big consequences. Isn't he a great storyteller? I mean, I guess <laughs> he's been the story. And wonderful. I think it's true. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Evenwell versus Abbott was decided on April 4th of this year by the Supreme Court, and it was a challenge to redistricting in Texas. So the court, there were no dissents, not even from Clarence Thomas, ruled that redistricting must be based on total population, that is, voters and non-voters, and not, as the state of Texas argued, restricted only to population based on voters, registered voters. All right, so we've got Citizens United, for voting rights, bad for voting rights, and you've got even well, which seems good for voting rights. Is. What is the court doing? So it's an interesting thing. So the what? So in uh, throughout history, the only time where the the Supreme Court has become active in the issue of voting and democracy only in two periods: one during the Warren Court era of the 1960s, where, and more recently in the Citizens United Roberts Court. Scalia court era. The, the one time where the Supreme Court sort of went ahead of where the rest of the political system was, was in the cases Baker versus Carr and Re Reynolds v. Sims. These are called the one person, one vote cases, in which they said, you know, that the, you had rural districts with no people in them overrepresented in the legislatures. And uh, as cities grew, they never changed the voting lines. And so the Supreme Court said that that was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause in the Constitution, that you needed to basically have equality of the size of districts. And that was a huge deal. It, it changed the way state governments worked. Um, and as I learned in researching the book, this is an amazing story to me at least, the phrase one person, one vote certainly doesn't occur in the Constitution, and it barely occurred in American language up until the time of these cases. The first time the phrase one man, one vote, and one person, one vote was used in a big way was John Lewis was speaking at the March on Washington and said, that must now be our cry, one person, one vote. That is the cry of the African liberation movement. That must be our cry. And he got it directly from Nelson Mandela, who was a fugitive at the time, but had adopted one person, one vote as the slogan for the ANC. And that was known, that was what Lewis explicitly said was the basis for it. And then a few years later, the Supreme Court adopted it. Well, it's been revolutionary, but they never really said, how do you count one person? Now, all 50 states right now count total population, whether you're a citizen or a non-citizen, a child who can't vote, or a voter, eligible voter, everybody deserves to be represented. That's how all 50 states do it. Uh, the same very conservative think tank that brought the case that gutted the Voting Rights Act and also coincidentally that brought the case challenging affirmative action, the Fisher case, brought a case saying, no, it's not, it shouldn't be all people, it should be only eligible voters or citizens. Um, and it was a direct challenge to, among other things, the political representation of immigrant communities, uh, especially in Texas, the Latino community. And we, uh, we didn't think the Supreme Court should have taken the case. Uh, it sort of startled everybody when they did. My organization and others filed friend of the court briefs, urging them to follow the, the true constitutional practice over two centuries. The argument didn't go very well, I would say. Um, and then the ruling came down, and it was eight to nothing, upholding one person, one vote, upholding the idea that all people, not just citizens, need to be represented. One of the great mysteries, of course, is what would have happened if Justice Scalia had been alive? Would it have been eight to one or nine to nothing? Uh, but uh, this is, could be something where the tenor of the court has already begun to change. This is the Commonwealth Club of California program. <clears throat> and we're talking to Michael Waldman, president of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law School and the author of The Fight to Vote. I am Judge Ladaris Hazard Cordell, your moderator. And you can hear the Commonwealth Club programs on the radio, catch up with us on Facebook and Twitter, and see program videos on your YouTube channel. All right, so Michael, there's the matter of voter suppression. After the Supreme Court practically gutted the Voting Rights Act, several states 
and I think all of which had Republican governors, quickly enacted restrictions on voting in forms such as no more early voting, no voting on Sundays after church services, which mm -hmm. really impacted African-American communities, requiring IDs, shutting down polling places, causing outrageously long and frustrating voting lines. So what's next? I mean, are we back to literacy tests? Uh, are, are we voters helpless to stop these attempts to suppress the vote? And is voter suppression limit, does it really limit voter turnout? Is that why turnout is so low? <clears throat> uh, turnout is low for many reasons, and it's hard to be very precise mm -hmm. in attributing that phenomenon to these laws. But here are the facts. This is the, uh, this year, uh, in 17 states, there will be new laws on the books implemented for the first time that make it harder for people to vote in effect in a high turnout uh, national election. It's the first presidential election in half a century without the full strength of the Voting Rights Act. There has been a fiercely uh, effective strategy uh, to pass these laws all at once on the theory that it's needed to stop uh, voter fraud, uh, a phenomenon that uh, is almost vanishingly rare or non-existent based on uh, the kind of voter fraud that these laws would prevent, which is in-person voter impersonation. A federal judge in Wisconsin ruled that you, because you, would ha you could go to jail for several years and pay a $10,000 fine for casting one fraudulent vote in someone else's name, that you would actually have to be insane to do it. <laughs> That's actually a ruling from a federal judge. Um, uh, the Voting Rights Act protected in many places against these laws. What was especially effective about that law, which was the most effective civil rights law in the country's history, was it said that you had to have um, pre-approval by the Justice Department or a federal court in states where there was a history of discrimination, uh, in states where, uh, where uh, there was a record of having had this kind of problem. And in the courtroom, Ju Justice Scalia said that this was, uh, this was nothing more, the Voting Rights Act, he said, than a racial entitlement. And people gasped, even in the courtroom. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion in the Shelby County case. And he didn't say that, although that was perhaps the spirit. What he said, in effect, was that was then, this is now. Uh, that the, the problems had been addressed, that in fact, as he pointed out, black voter turnout rates were higher in the South than white voter turnout rates at that point. Um, so it wasn't needed anymore. Justice Ginsburg wrote a very powerful dissent. She said, look, uh, that's like standing in a rainstorm with an umbrella and saying, well, I'm not getting wet. I guess I don't need the umbrella anymore. <laughs> so who was right? Well, two hours after that ruling came down, the state of Texas implemented its voter ID law. And this is sort of a notorious law that it was very mischievously and carefully crafted. This is the law where you cannot use your University of Texas student ID to vote, but you can use your concealed carry gun permit. Gee, I wonder who, who that benefits. Um, and although Stephen Colbert uh, reported on this, and he said, that's really very democratic. It's a lot easier to get a gun than a college degree. Right? So, <laughs> but I don't think that was what they had in mind. Instantly, instantly, uh, 608,000 registered voters in Texas lost their right to vote. Um, one of them uh, was a woman named Sammy Louise Bates. She was born in Mississippi. She remembered growing up counting out the money for her grandmother to pay the poll tax. She moved to Detroit and then to Chicago. It's kind of the great story of the, the Great Migration. She's African American. She went to college, worked up there, and then retired to Texas. And she lives in Texas now on Social Security and nothing else. And she's been voting since she was 21 and lost the right to vote. And she was asked, she was a witness in the ca federal case that my organization brought. Uh, we asked her, well, why didn't you just get your birth certificate uh, from Mississippi? And she said, well, that cost $42. 
And I had to put those $42 where they would do the most good. You can't eat a birth certificate. She was the lead witness in the federal case. And her testimony, among others, persuaded a judge to rule that this law was unconstitutional, uh, deliberately discriminatory, and uh, illegal. The most conservative appeals court in the country agreed, and it's still in the books, because the system is grinding very slowly. Um, and we know that in Texas, there's hundreds of thousands. We know that in Wisconsin, there's 300,000 voters who don't have their form of ID. And we can't say for sure what the turnout impact is, but there's starting to be evidence. The GAO, the Government Accountability Office, the nonpartisan think tank used by Republican and Democratic members of Congress alike, studied this and found that the most severe uh, laws, voter ID laws, suppress turnout, 3% uh, among African American voters. I like to say, finally, a government program that works yeah. as intended. You know, And I should say, I'm not against voter ID. I'm actually for voter ID. I think it's not crazy for people to have to be who they say they are and not crazy to have to prove it. You know, And we, it's very hard to go through life in this day and age without some form of ID. The problem is requiring forms of ID that lots of people do not have. And about 11% nationwide of eligible voters just do not have a driver's license or those particular kinds of ID. We could easily solve this problem. There are all kinds of ID laws that don't disenfranchise. They're easy to pass, they're easy to enforce. But unfortunately, that's not what a lot of these states have done. Well, it's time now for our audience questions. And we do have a number of questions, so I'm gonna throw one out to you. Should we all move to vote by mail to eliminate the voter ID problem? Homeless people could give homeless shelters as their address. How else can we get around suppression apart from amending the Constitution again? Well, for starters, in terms of how are we, gonna, how are we going to stop the suppression, uh, it is up to the courts to do their part. There are other laws in the Voting Rights Act, including parts of the Voting Rights Act that weren't gutted, uh, that are being used by courts. Uh, it's also up to all of us to to call attention, to demand that politicians do something about this, and to push back. And when there have been these suppressions, in fact, uh, my organization found that the voting laws passed as of 2012 would uh, potentially make it harder or impossible for five million people to vote before the 2012 election. But they were all the worst laws were blocked or blunted or postponed or repealed in the courts by Republican and Democratic judges alike. So there's still something that can be done. Vote by mail is one of the solutions. There are some states uh, where that's the only way to vote. Um, or in California and other places, it's, may, it's, it's one of the options. Today, about a third of voters vote before election day, whether it's by mail or early in-person voting or absentee. It's kind of a form of customer service, and it's made it a lot easier in this day and age where men and women work and where people can't take half a day off to vote. Um, so vote by mail is one of the answers. I don't think it's the only answer. I think that there's a lot of folks for whom uh, showing up early and having standard national rules for how many days of in-person early voting uh, could be some of the most secure and beneficial ways of all. Uh, this is kind of um, a little off, but on our subject. As a former speechwriter, what do you make of Donald Trump's lack of a formal speechwriter? <laughs> and is there any evidence, do you think, that Trump has or will break with the Republic Republican Party's stance on voting rights and practices? <clears throat> well, Trump doesn't use a speechwriter, uh, but that's no excuse. Um, <laughs> although, you know, Bill Clinton, so I was, as was mentioned, I was his chief speechwriter. Um, he never had a speechwriter before he was president. When he was governor, he, he did it himself, and he much preferred to do it himself. Um, uh, he, when, we would, when he would give a speech, if it was supposed to be a, a half hour long, we would give him 15 minutes, because we knew he would double it. Um, and uh, he, I used to tell the new speechwriters that what we almost were to give him, what he really wanted were almost outlines, facts and figures, and he wanted to add the emotional component himself, and, and they were, I would say, don't worry, we give him Hemingway, he'll turn it into Faulkner. <laughs> you know, it gets longer and more Southern. So it's not just that he didn't have a speechwriter. Trump is uh, bringing to the fore um, a level of 
ugliness and overt nativism and overt racism, frankly, in the way he talks that we've not heard from public figures since really the 1930s, nobody running for president. When George Wallace ran for president in the 60s, he was much more euphemistic than Trump. You talk about those federal bureaucrats up in Washington uh, don't understand how to do things, they can't park a bicycle straight. Um, he didn't say, you know, immigrants are criminals uh, or any of the things Trump's been saying. Um, so uh, now, one of the things that's interesting about Trump, as you know, is that he is not purely an orthodox conservative. There are some aspects of his policy mix that are actually more to the center. He's for entitlements. He's been for single-payer health care. Um, he's praised Planned Parenthood. There are aspects of his mix uh, that are, um, that are uh, equally upsetting to the Republican uh, uh, orthodoxy. He's really much more like a European-style right-wing populist nativist party like you know, the UKIP party in England or the National Front in France. So is this one of the areas where he might break with that orthodoxy? I wouldn't bet on it. Um, he's very busily, well, it's an interesting thing. So uh, after the Iowa caucus, which was so close in, in both parties, Donald Trump said there was voter fraud, and Bernie Sanders said the voting machines must have been rigged. So both parties kind of reverted to their, went to their corners. Trump is, uh, taught, throws a lot of loose talk around about voter fraud, but suddenly in the last week or two, he's, he has been talking like a rather passionate advocate of changing the rules once he's discovered how rigged they are against his candidacy in the Republican <laughs> Party. Um, I, I don't know, anybody who claims they knew that the, in the Republican side, this is not the case in the Democratic side, that they, delegates don't necessarily have to actually support the candidate that they're pledged to vote for. That was a surprise to me, and apparently it was a surprise to him as well. So maybe he'll be a passionate advocate for uh, reform, though wow. I'm not holding my breath. Wow. Is there any legislative effort at state or federal levels to reinstate the vote for those convicted of felonies? Mm -hmm. Great question and an important, uh, an important question. Um, we are one of the only democracies that has millions of people who are barred from voting because they have a past criminal conviction. And these are people uh, usually who are in the community, back in the community, they've served their time, they're paying taxes, they're trying to do the right thing, but they're barred from voting because of something they did in the past. This, interestingly, was authorized in the 14th Amendment. There's a long constitutional tradition behind it but it has been enforced, especially in a very racially discriminatory manner, going back to the Jim Crow constitutions. Um, there is actually a movement, a successful and growing movement to do something about this nationwide that brings together right and left. Uh, in a way, it's a kind of an outgrowth of the very encouraging uh, commonality that we now see on criminal justice reform where you have liberals and conservatives both realizing we have to do something about mass incarceration, about the fact that we have in our country 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prison population with massive consequences, social and racial and economic. And so there's a real left-right coming together. We work, in the Brandon Center, we work closely with the Koch brothers on criminal justice reform. Um, oh dear. We, we do. Um, and and uh, there's, there's a lot happening, and what's interesting is that on the effort to restore the right to vote for people with criminal convictions, which people see if the criminal justice system is over-criminalizing and is unfair, this is a sort of a, an ancillary consequence of that. Um, the evangelical right has been a powerful voice for this for a while. Um, Rand Paul is one of our uh, big champions in Congress on this. We used to work with Chuck Colson, the former Watergate felon when he was alive, who became a minister uh, and ran prison fellowship. There's a lot of progress on this. Just a few weeks ago, the state of Maryland uh, returned the right to vote to 40,000 people who had had it denied, although the governor vetoed it, it was overturned by the legislature. But there are three states where it is still the case that anybody who's had a criminal conviction is barred from voting for life. Florida, surprise, surprise, Virginia, and of all places, Iowa. 
um, and it requires the governors of those states to pardon people. Um, so it, there, it's, it's slow progress, but there is actual progress being made. What are your thoughts on mandatory voting as in Australia? And it's second question, same one. What are your views on the idea of a fine for not voting or having to pay? It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. I think I get asked this question more often than any other question. Um, uh, some countries, especially in South America and Australia, actually require people to vote. Um, and President Obama ha floated this idea as one solution, and I th have a feeling that may be why people are thinking about it. Uh, I am of mixed minds. I'm for it uh, in the sense that I think I can certainly see the arguments for it. Uh, we're required to serve on juries. We're required to uh, pay taxes. We're required to um, uh, sign up for the draft, those of us who are men, um, and maybe women too. So I think that there's a strong argument that this is a part of, of the duty of citizens on the one hand. On the other hand, I don't think there is a possibility that the country in which we happen to live would ever do this. I think that the libertarian streak is far too strong uh, and people just would re reject it. And I think there are steps that can be taken that don't go that far that could have a very profound uh, and positive impact. The single most important uh, thing, uh, the single most important change that could happen in our voting right now would be to have automatic and universal voter registration uh, so that everybody who's a citizen who's eligible to vote is on the rolls permanently. That's how other democracies do it. And if you had that be the case, if government took on that responsibility, it would add 55 million people to the rolls permanently. It would cost less. And for people who are really worried about voter fraud, it would address that too, because these are government lists. And uh, there's exciting progress there. Even as some states are moving to make things worse, there's a national breakout movement happening right now for this game-changing uh, reform. Oregon and California last year passed automatic voter registration through the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles. So it's not everything, but it's a very big change. Secretary of State Alex Padilla is a national leader on this. Um, and is actually coming to keynote a conference at NYU Law School at the Brennan Center uh, next month of people from all over the country who are working on this. Um, West Virginia, uh, three weeks ago, passed this, Democrats and Republicans, and yesterday, Vermont enacted it. Uh, this is actually taking off, and it, as I say, it's not only Democratic states, it's, it's Republican states too. Um, it, it's very exciting, and that would not solve all the problems, but that would enfranchise a lot of people and, uh, and would enable all the people who have to spend all their time registering voters to turn their attention to actually winning voters over uh, mobilizing people and, and things that shouldn't be, uh, you know, this is the job of the government and they, they have the lists, they can, they can make sure we can vote. Can you talk to us a little about the primary system and has it outlived its usefulness? So, the, I had some thoughts on the primaries even before these primaries. Um, and there, a lot of times people ask me, so do you still support the right to vote? Um, <laughs> and I usually do. Um, primaries were uh, one of the reforms that came out of the progressive era, along with um, referendum, and other forms of direct democracy. And of course, the positive part of this is it gives voters a direct voice. The downside of primaries is that they undermine one of the institutions that turned out to play a surprisingly positive and a surprisingly important role in the expansion of democracy, which is political parties. Um, I was struck and surprised a bit by my conclusion in learning about this over and over again, how important uh, political parties were because of the way they could mobilize ordinary citizens. And primaries tend to, tend to undermine that, and they also have a tendency, as I wrote even before the current election, to pull the uh, parties to perhaps their extremes. Because even if you think about it, even in this election, uh, with all the noise, only 11% of eligible Democratic Party voters are voting in these primaries. Um, so it's really a very small group. Um, and it has helped to lead to the, some of the polarization 
in legislative bodies in Congress and elsewhere that have made governing so difficult. You know, we have a political system that's Madisonian. It was designed by James Madison and others with all these checks and balances and all these veto points. But we've never before had two political parties, one to the left and one to the right. And it turns out that those two things in combination have never been tried before, and maybe it doesn't work very well. So obviously, I wouldn't take away primaries. Uh, it is a way to engage people. It can be a way to kind of crash the party, to, to have people's voices heard. We certainly see that in this election. But uh, it also can undermine, ironically, some of the benefits that come from strong political parties. So I, I, uh, I, I don't know that I would, uh, I, I don't know that I have a, a whole set of changes to make. I get asked quite a bit about superdelegates. People are also surprised yes. to learn of the existence of superdelegates. Those were instituted not this election to help one candidate or another, but because without them, members of Congress, union leaders, uh, at party activists, people who are actually working for the Democratic Party, it's only in the Democratic Party, wouldn't go to the conventions. Uh, and so it's a way to have some semblance of an ongoing political party, although you don't want to have a situation where they vote a different way than the voters. That's never happened before. Mm. And by the way, it doesn't look like it's going to happen this time. The one thing people, uh, you know, uh, s supporters of Senator Sanders feel that the superdelegates are uh, rigging the system in support of Secretary Clinton, she's won two million more popular votes so far than he has. Uh, and if trends continue, the superdelegates will not determine the outcome. Wow. We've just learned so much watching this election. I mean, yeah. Right, right. It's <laughs> amazing. Um, Citizens United, this is another question. Um, it appears to be grounded in significant amount of precedent, difficult to overturn. How, how do we do this? That is a great question, and I, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about that. The Brennan Center, along with other, uh, other <coughs> constitutional law groups and those fighting for changes in the way we fund campaigns, we are engaged in a decade-long drive, or less, to overturn Citizens United, um, a, a campaign for constitutional change. And in fact, not just to overturn Citizens United, but to overturn some of the other Supreme Court cases, earlier cases that really sort of set us wobbling off in this uh, misguided direction. The case, the key case uh, that some of you know of called Buckley versus Faleo from the 1970s, which was kind of the case that said in the campaign context, money is speech and you therefore can't do anything to restrict it other than the narrowest of corruption fighting measures. Um, you know, how do you get this kind of constitutional change? Well, for starters, Citizens United rests on a very frail uh, foundation. It was a five to four decision based on misguided assu assumptions about what would happen. It said that there would be independent spending. It really was only dealing with independent spending, um, but that the spending would be genuinely independent and that it would all be disclosed. And I like to quote uh, Groucho Marx, uh, who are you gonna believe, me or your own eyes? You know, we know that that's not <laughs> the case. We see how this has effectively deregulated um, uh, our politics. Um, but it's important, so we're engaged in scholarship, we're looking at litigation strategies, even before uh, Justice Scalia died, and suddenly now you have four uh, votes, four, a four-four tie in effect, uh, on Citizens United based on who was on the court. But one of the great lessons of history is that real legal change, a real major constitutional change, does not come just from a really well-crafted lawsuit. It doesn't come in a court of law. You have to win first in the court of public opinion. Now, in this case, the public is already there. Uh, in the case of voting rights, we've had to work to change public opinion and teach the judges what's really going on, and you get much better rulings when that happens. So we're engaged in looking at scholarship and showing the, the, the ways in which Citizens United uh, played out differently from what the justices said it would. Even though Citizens United is unpopular, even though I believe that they wanna overturn it, they won't just overturn the precedent, they won't violate the Latin phrase stare decisis, without a strong record. 
Um, and uh, a Merrick Garland, should he be confirmed, uh, which I realize is not a done deal by any means, um, uh, he's a very careful judge, and he's not the kind who's going to just overturn Citizens United because he feels like it. So there has to be a, 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 we don't want to be rash in how this happens, but it, it's going to be one of the major constitutional fights. Both uh, Secretary Clinton and Senator Sanders have said that it is a litmus test for who they would appoint to the Supreme Court that they would overturn Citizens United. So you believe it will happen in our lifetime? It will, be, it will happen. Uh, it will, I, I'm certain it will happen in our lifetime. Well, Michael Waldman, this is great. To end on a positive note. Um, there, so Michael, there's no videotape of this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Michael, we've, now, we've come to the end of our program, and, and I'd like to close our conversation by asking you to read a passage from your book. Uh, when I read this passage, I said, this gets to the heart of the fight to vote. And I have the book right here, and I've actually clipped and if, would you read that for us and we'll close? I would close? be thrilled. Okay. Any author who pretended they didn't like this <laughs> is lying. It is the end of the book. Uh, and as I said, it just proves the power of caffeine. Um, uh, the fight for the vote over the years has been more than a clash of classes, parties, factions, races, and interests. It has been a long drive, stumbling, retreating, but ultimately in one direction, to try to fulfill the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. So we should all regard it as not just wrong, but fundamentally illegitimate, indeed un-American, to try to make it harder for another American to vote. Half of all eligible citizens stay home. We should make it easier for them to participate and make it so they want to. At this point, debating the issues of the direction of American democracy is no longer new. It may seem jarring, but in fact, this debate is typical and understandable. The fight to vote is at the heart of American history. It is up to all of us to advance that fight and keep it at the center of debate today where it belongs. Our thanks, to, our thanks to Michael Waldman, president of the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law. Thank you all so much for being with us. And, for, and Michael, we thank you for writing a much needed and immensely enjoyable book, The Fight to Vote. I am Judge Ladaris Hazard Cordell, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know, is adjourned. Thank you.